Here we are. Hello, everyone, <laughs> and welcome back to Jake's Take with Jacob Aishar podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Aishar, the chief content producer and writer of jakestake.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. Now, before we get started, if you're watching this on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe. And also, if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts and any other of our audio channels, please give this episode a five-star rating and also the podcast a five-star rating. I really appreciate it. Today, I'm talking with my friend Dan Dwoskin, who is, represents the pop rock Americana band from all the way in Ontario, Canada. He, they are, the, now, the Honey Runners are pop, are Spotify verified artists, and as of this recording, they have over 2,000 Twitter followers and 3,000 Facebook followers. So, Dan Dwoskin, welcome to the Jake's Take with Jacob Alicia podcast. Ooh, that's a pretty bold move, Jacob, asking for five stars even before the show starts. How are they going to know this is going to be a good one? Uh, um, my colleagues do that all the time, so I have to see. I stole that from them. Yeah, fair play. Like and subscribe. Bam, 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 thank, bam, bam. Thank you so much. So now before we got on, guys, I just want to let you know, Dan has told me that the Honey Runners have been in bands for over nine years. So could you please describe the band's origin story to my audience? Uh, yeah, a, a meteor hit Toronto. And a whole bunch of people got affected musically by the powers of this meteor. And so we formed a band. And that's it. That's the origin. <laughs> the, uh, okay. The real, the real origin. All right. Uh, we, there was a, get this, a porno rock band. You heard okay. that right. There was a porno, a porno rock, rock band, band that was on Universal. Imagine Frank Zappa, but like dirtier. Okay, um, okay. Frank Zappas can be one person that can be that can pull it. a lot of punches. So this band used to play um, on Playboy TV and at the Playboy Mansion. And one day uh, on Craigslist, I came back. Um, I was in Australia for a while. Came back to Toronto, and I found a posting for a piano player for this band. And I was like, "All right, sure, why not?" Right. So dove into that. This band was the launch pad for me to meet all sorts of musicians who were so far from kind of the the jokey atmosphere of what this band was. And that actually led us to to work on projects together after that. And and the the members of this thing were so talented that it was it, it became so easy to find new players to start a band from this. The origin of the band name itself is actually from Keith Richards' book. Um, I'm obsessed with the Rolling Stones. Love Keith Richards. He's one of my favorite guitar players. And there, there was a there was an excerpt from his book that talked about sending little kids running through honey naked to kind of retrieve his drugs <laughs> through you know a field a field of hash or something. And I thought to myself, all right, that's a uh, that's a pretty dark, unique band name. So I I pulled that from there. And I mean, because we're in the day and age where it's like, it's hard to find a good band name. You know what I mean? Like, we've got some pretty weird bands out there now just because people couldn't like brand themselves. <laughs> so anyway, that's where the Honey Runners came from. And that's it. That's our origin story for you. Awesome. So I want to give you like, I do have, I do have a Rolling Stones connection because I had Sasha Allen, one of their great backing vocalists on it earlier this year and boy what a voice so and oh, she was funny about and she was doing the Havana Nights thing when they performed in Cuba so it was a really good really good show the uh did you watch the um what's that one 20 feet from stardom um I didn't I I've heard of it and Mary Clayton oh, oh, Mary watch Clayton it. I got to features Darlene she Love has Mary a Clayton voice. Judith Hill yeah, I agree, and I've heard. I watched a clip of Mary of Mary of it for, about Mary's origin. I'm like, wow, she got up from the middle of the night and recorded that. Yeah, man, that's rock and roll. You got you <laughs> you got to be ready. <laughs> All right, so let's talk. Let's talk. We're here to talk about the Honey Runners, not the Rolling Stones. Absolutely. All right, so besides the Rolling Stones. Who are your the Honey Runners music role models, and how do they enhance the sound, the group sound? That's a good question. Uh, current or old? Um, both. Both. All right. Let's start with the old, and we'll go to the current. Um, 
as a as a vocalist and a keys player, I came up learning how to really write songs, listening to the Beatles, like everyone else in the world right now, you know. Um, but I learned I also learned keys chops from Ray Charles, and um, I take a lot of cues from from singers like Aretha Franklin and Etta James, and old blues like um, Bo Diddley and Buddy Guy and Keb Mo, and like I kind of started with old blues and I worked my way up kind of blues, gospel, rock and roll, punk, jazz, pop, you know, the whole thing. I, when I was, as I was growing up, another really big influence um, on me was Led Zeppelin um, just for plant the whole dynamic of the band itself, that such unique players. And it's funny because people build them as rock and roll, which they are inevitably, but you know, you listen to something like going to California and that's folk music, you, you know, that, that was genre bending. And, um, you know, the rest of the band, uh, my, you know, my, my partner in crime, uh, my bass player and singer and also a producer of the band, Guillermo Subalste is uh, Peruvian. He, he grew up in, in Lima. So he actually had a hand in, in starting the Lima punk scene. Like the, the whole thing, he was, he had a big hand in that. But that's a kind of a longer story for another day. I totally agree, but that's an incredible accomplishment. Oh, absolutely. So you've got, you know, I, I'm kind of foundations in rock and blues and, and folk. He's, you know, punk rock and, and electronic kind of stuff. Uh, our drummer listens to a lot of um, kind of like funk, funk and soul and Dixieland, a lot of like New Orleans influence like Dr. John and Stevie Wonder and same, our guitar player is like pure soul. Uh, his name's Connor Gaines. And Connor is, um, he's got his own solo project going now. And the guy just just sounds, he's got an incredible voice. So that's that's old influence. We're talking, you know, uh, Rolling the Stones, classics. Beatles, classics. Um, the, not, the not so old stuff, we're looking at, um, you know, I'm a huge fan of Billie Eilish, just for production standpoint and performance. Uh, Leon Bridges, Nathaniel okay. Rateliff. I'm personally, I'm obsessed with um, the Lumineers. They just got me. The first album was like, it's okay. Album two and three from the Lumineers just like sucked me right in as, as a songwriter. It, it's phenomenal songwriting. And I, I have a, a playlist. I'll send it to you after this. I have a playlist of all the stuff that I'm like currently obsessed with. And a lot of it is new music. Awesome. I gotta say, but I gotta give Billie Eilish and Phineas credit, though. They've done a lot in the past five years. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, Phineas is, is funny. Um, I mean, he gets credit within the music industry, but I think the, the wider population doesn't realize how much of a, an incredible songwriter and, and producer he is. Did you see that documentary? I did not have the chance to see that documentary just yet. That was a wonderful one. It gives you a lot of insight into... Um, Billie Eilish's personal challenges that she goes through. It, it's a, that's a heavy life, man. It is. It is and a lot of music today. It is heavy. So speaking of heavy, what have been some of the challenges that the Honey Runners face, not breaking into the North American music market, but also the international music market? And how have you guys overcome those obstacles? Um, there's. That's also a very good question. There's a lot of barriers to entry in this. We've been an independent band for nine years. The, the honestly, persistence, persistence is is a huge thing, and because you're gonna just get rejected constantly, and you're always gonna feel like you're not good enough for this. You know, in music, in such a um, in such a saturated art form right now, because you have access to everything to produce your own stuff and market it. And so you have to remember that there is still magic. Like music really still possesses a magic that people don't understand. And it's funny to see labels and, and um, pop culture people try to break down good songs and say, well, that's the formula for this song. Cause they don't, you know, like they don't fully understand it. I don't think. Um, and, and that's what I love so much about it. This is the Wild West. If you persist and you're good at what you do, you know, you really, you can drive this thing a, a long way. And 
on, I mean, the biggest barrier to entry is money. It's the hardest thing because it costs to tour. Like, man, we go on the road. Like, if we're coming to state down down to Kansas City, like Folk Alliance is ne- is next um, February is back in its hometown, and it, you know, even getting there for that costs a lot of money for us. So it's like you you need something. You need something to kind of cave in order to let you in whether that's money or power or whatever it is. I totally agree. It's definitely been a, it definitely is a roller coaster axis because the thing is I'd rather go on my own pace and be like some of my role models, media role models like Regis and Barbara Walters and they lasted up until their eighties. So I'd rather yeah. see me doing this for a long time instead of seeing my colleagues like fizzle and out, fizzle out after five years. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, like, it was how, I mean, you must have a love for talking with people, right? With strangers, because this is the whole, that's the whole gig in, in journalism, you know? Absolutely. I love to story tell and I love conversations. You know, the best, the best thing I ever heard was that really taught me a good lesson about interviewing was from Dick Cavett. You ever watched Dick Cavett? Oh yeah. I've seen some of his clips left and right. Oh man. He, he was a brilliant interviewer and he said basically let the silence linger like just a little bit too long and what happens is your guests end up giving you some magic that you did not think you could get in an interview but because it kind of makes people feel uncomfortable right when you leave dead air especially on live television so that was like i was like oh i'm going to use that for sure that's Except the, the hard part is, I was going to say, the hard part is I talk too much <laughs> and, I inter- and I interrupt people all the time. So there's that. I have that problem constantly. So you're well, you're not the only one. Oh, it's an art form, man. You're, it's, you're good at what you do. Thank you. I appreciate that, Dan. I really do. All righty. So we got to talk about. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic turned everyone's worlds upside down. So how did the Honey Runners manage to keep busy and stay connected to your fans? Social media became a really big thing. Our, um, we, we jumped on virtual concerts pretty quickly. We started, um, we had actually been doing that before the pandemic hit. We were, we were dabbling with doing like live studio stuff through something called Patches Sessions, where we were actually going to bring um, other musicians in studio and interview them and, um, you know, give people like a behind the scenes look at what our band actually does in studio. And then the pandemic hit. And so we were like, well, we're, you know, we're already set up for this. So we kind of kept rolling with that. And so we did, we, we aired a lot of like, you know, virtual sessions where everyone's split in different rooms and it looked like it was a bit weird. Like definitely it took a lot of um, adjusting. But we got pretty good at it by the end of it. So, you know, some of our videos were, were great. And honestly, we just, we we used it as a time to just like reconnect with why we're doing this. And a lot of people, for instance, like um, I have a, a, you know, a three-year-old uh, Guillermo has, he, at the time, had a one-year-old, like we were all going through this throes of fatherhood too. So, you know, there was plenty to keep us busy. You know, every, and we had been going Honey Runners nonstop before then. So it was a good time to kind of like bring that to a, a, a bit of a slowdown so that we could recollect why we actually want to play music and why this is still special for us. And so it was okay. We were okay with that. Everyone, everyone else, you know, I guess was really doing the same thing. They were questioning why they were doing this. There's so many musicians that just stopped. They decided to quit music because it was a big like reckoning. You know, a lot of people lost that, um, I don't know what you call it, lust for why why they do this. Yeah, exactly. Like the mojo disappeared because people like artists have to have that because what, you know, if you're going to do it as a trade, man, that's a, you're going to get dragged through the mud, like a lot. Right. So you need that mojo. Second, you lose that. Like you're gone. 
I'm just great. I'm I like I'm grateful that we that you guys had the ability to connect with your fans and perform digitally. And also yeah. for me, I had the opportunity to connect with people I never thought I would connect with again on uh, through podcasting. So this was great. This the last year, even though it was, was a bless, even though it was a curse, it was considered a blessing. And one of the biggest blessings happened when I gave, when my nephew Nash Carey appeared. Amazing! Congratulations. Thank you so much. So I want to talk to you about because I was on your YouTube channel. And I saw that you guys performed your very first live show at the Empire Theater for the first time. And we did. And you mentioned that you admitted during the, your performance that it was the first time that several members of the band performing live music in a long time. So what did performing at the Empire Theater mean to everybody? That that was such a cool moment in time. We you know, we haven't even released that yet. The um we'll probably do like a live stream of it, but the um basically with with moments like that on a big stage when you get like you know 11 musicians and you know nine cameras and like a whole crew like for lighting and stage setup was really more about capturing that moment in time it was about walking away with that knowing that like these guys hasn't played hadn't played music together in like two years and we just felt so good to have them all on stage together like we we've never played with an 11 piece band so you know getting people with the lights and the stage and the cameras and we played the first song and we like we giggled after the first song because it was just like so much power and it felt so damn good so you know they, we we do that because all you can do is just take a snapshot at that moment and just move on you know what I like that approach for music because I don't think that you can really hold on to these moments. So you, it's it's important you capture those things when you can. I totally agree. I totally agree. It's important. Like I can definitely feel for like all the bro for all the Broadway performers and like this and also all of the people who do television when they first came back after a long hiatus. Yeah, man. Like you better be sure that the cameras are rolling when things like this happen. Otherwise, it just gets lost to time, you know? All right. So speaking of time, we got to talk about your album, Everything is on Fire. Can you describe that album to my audience? Yes. This album is kind of an Americana-tinged folk rock pop wonderland. It is a mashup of all the things that we have been working towards for the better part of nine years. The reason that we called it everything is on fire and, and to be like we actually named this thing pre-pandemic like way pre-pandemic we had we had a lot of these songs wrapped and titled and everything's ready to go so the first time we were going to release this album um australia was on fire and la too and so we were like we were like oh i don't know if this is a good time to do this and then we waited a little bit we polished it up went back into production and we produced the hell out of this thing. This is just Guillermo and I just did this, the two of us with um, a lot of help from, from a lot of guest players in studio. It was a really interesting scenario. And so we had the time to really get into the mix and get obsessed over the production. And like, if you, if you listen to this album on good headphones or on, on uh, vinyl, this thing is like, is a masterpiece of production where we're very proud of it. And it's every song really, um, we had about 40 songs that we called down to nine. Wow. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff didn't make it to the cutting room floor. And, um, but these nine, you know, like when we play these live, it really, um, it makes us happy to play because we know that we, we chose the right ones. And then it really does tell a story about what we were going through at the time. A lot, a lot of this album is about fear and anxiety and, and it's ironic because it really hits home now when, when I listen back to it after having gone through this last year and a half of, you know, pandemic, I listened to the album and, and we're like, damn, like this translates. It's, it's not just, you know, something that we were going through before this. And so that's, it, you know, kind of makes us happy that it's so universal. Um, yeah, I guess. How, how's that? 
And I do and that. That's a great answer. That's a fabulous answer. Excellent. And I cannot wait to hear this album. And I've got to talk about songs because what attracted to me to your music was was your songs. And when I saw a mix, when I heard mixtape, I was blown away. So awesome. can you please you. describe that song to me, to my audience and the story behind oh, it? Yeah, absolutely. Mix mixtape was a funny one. Uh, we wrote that one one earlier on, and that was an exercise in simplicity because we we don't write a lot of straightforward pop songs, even though we kind of get billed as pop. Um, we really um, mixtape was kind of came around from Guillermo, who laid down a really um, heavy duty drum and bass beat to that song. So you've got the um, it's like <laughs> I don't want to sing it for you, but so the the bass is like doom, like doom, 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 doom. like it's really um it's really a driving rhythm, and the drums it's it's doing this crazy sixth sixteenth thing. So it's like and you got that going throughout the whole song. And so what we really tried to do is then slow down the lyrics so that you had a nice juxtaposition between the two, and these really um. We were listening to a lot of, uh, this is funny, the influences for this one, Taylor Swift, uh, War on Drugs, Mark Knopfler, Bruce Springsteen, and uh, maybe a little bit of like Bob Dylan. So, and, and, and Bowie. So that, this whole song, you know, we were, we were kind of searching for hooks and writing in studio and this thing started to really take shape and we had to really wrestle it into place. But once we did, Oh my God, man! It was, it, it was the first uh, real like pop song I feel like we've ever written, and and it felt good. People people have been really gravitating towards it on uh, like radio and on social right now. That's amazing, and I want to talk to you about another song because Ghost. Oh my God, the shades of Rolling Stones typically for Devil, and then at the beginning yeah. I heard the shades of Valerie from Amy Winehouse. Cool, nice. From the, was, you mean from the drums, like yeah, the old, the old, the old stomp clap. That's oh, yeah. that's the best. That stuff like that, you, you got to be gentle with that in production, just so it doesn't drive people crazy. But I, I think we kind of towed the line. That that song is so fun to play live because that's like straight up New Orleans with a little bit of like, um, almost like. Do you listen to a lot of like Creedence Clearwater? A little bit, a little bit. So John Fogerty. Yeah, so that that one's really, um, really the chorus kind of came from from that place where we we needed to go from a fast groove into like a deep pocket, and like again live with horns and like when you get to the bridge of that song in Ghosts and you get the um, the horns going ba na ba na na ba da 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 da, it's crazy man, how much is happening at that moment, and uh, yeah, Guillermo like he he mixed it so well like there's hundreds of layers but there's still somehow manages to be space in that one it was it's great i gotta say i what i love while we're talking about that of like different movement and everything but when i listen to bones that acapella opening before you hear the entire orchestra before you hear the entire band whoa just gets it you yeah. gotta hear it live man you got you gotta come here live you gotta come to canada Maybe we'll come to Kansas City. I know. I if you guys come to Kansas City, great because if I I have to wait a couple more months, I have to wait to yeah. get my passports. <laughs> oh man, it's what a time right now. Um, we'll, we'll come down. You know, like I'm really I want to I want to do an American tour, especially on this album. I think it's going to hit pretty hard in the states. Uh, you know, make our way down to New Orleans, Memphis. Oh um, yeah, if you guys per go to the Preservation Jazz Hall game. That would be really good. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. All That'd right. So how about we talk about Under Your Control as of this recording is your most streamed song on Spotify? Yeah. Do you want to hear the, the backstory of this one? Oh, yes. The, uh, the this Under Control has got some of my favorite lyrics. One of my, my favorite lyrics from this song is, if home is where the heart is, then you must be homeless. And it, that's just the... <laughs> that's like a, that's a, wow. that's a, a real slap in the face oh yes the, there there was i don't know if I've, i told this i've told the story on stage i don't know if i ever told on video so here you go 
there was a critic that came to a show of ours and he worked for now magazine which in toronto is is a big publication it's that's basically the free like the one. stone yeah now magazine it's more like citywide but it has a pretty big audience and the so the thing with now is you really like you you really want the coverage it's just this good advertising for the band and one night we were playing this this prestigious venue here it's called horseshoe tavern and we were playing with like a motown review band from detroit and we're not really motown we're more like rock and roll but we fit the bill and we were playing also um this pop band open up called mono whales who are getting huge now Anyway, this guy came from now, and we didn't know he was there, but the next morning after the show, um, th this uh, promoter calls me, and he goes, hey, man, I'm still in bed. And he's like, hey, don't worry about the, the review and now, Meg. Like, don't worry about this guy. And I'm like, what? And it's like, I went online, and I read this review, and it is a takedown. He He just, like, he goes out of his way to, like, just slam the band like the guy just clearly like just hates straightforward rock and roll kind of shtick so that was our first now review and it was just awful it's one of those things you want to like frame on your wall and put it up there to like look at it and be like that's the one and so under control was a response to that critic and so the whole song about I guess it was kind of about critics in general, where it's like music, like they they feel they have all the control because they, you know, have a, a byline in a newspaper. And by no means do I hate. I love critics. Like critics are what makes us happen. But the um, but when they go out of their way to just like slam you, it feels awful because you spend all your time creating this music out of a place of love and like, you know, you, all your time booking these shows and you put all this work into it. And it's like, imagine you did that for like a painting and someone's just like, nah, hate it. Like, it, it's harsh, man. But you gotta like, gotta have thick skin. So like the best thing we can do is write a song about it and then have that song be our most streamed song ever, right? And I think you put, proved that critic wrong with the streams. God, I hope so. I hope he sees this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i admit sometimes i do like i was inspired by simon cowell for critics when it would when american idols was back in the heyday so yeah but that's his whole shtick though like when you see simon cowell you're like he's gonna slam them and then when he when when simon says something nice about someone that's when you're like oh damn they must be good yeah i actually had the privilege of talking with him twice this year just for nice. like for a quick virtual news for, for a virtual one pretty what was that one of the what was that like my career. um it was probably it was amazing and it was probably one of the best honors of my career and you guys can read that entire thing on jake-shake.com so for a plug but it was still one of the best things oh absolutely for, the, for those of you for those of you watching right now turn this one off and go watch the Simon Cowell episode. <laughs> oh, sorry. It was only for print, unfortunately, my friend. <laughs> they can true. double task. Yeah. All right. So we got to talk about who are, have, I want to, we got to start winding down our conversation, Dan. So who no are some of the bands and musicians and producers that are on the Honey Runners dream collaborations list? And how do they, Ooh. and how, and if you collaborate with them, how would they enhance your sound? Okay, well, oh, that's a great one. I love that. I think Brittany Howard, Alabama Shakes, she's like top of my hit list. I want to like write a song with her and Yola and Brandy Carlisle. That's like, you know, and then I want to steal James Brown's old rhythm section, the JBs, like the inventors of rhythm. Um, who else, you know, I want to, um, do you know, do you know Bahamas? You ever listen to a band called Bahamas? I have, unfortunately that band does not sound familiar to me. They're, they're great. He's, they're, they're kidding. He's a Canadian guy. His name's Afy. And he, he's just like wonderful music. He started under the banner of, uh, Jack Johnson's label, um, Brushfire Records. And he was just like, really just a great songwriter and a complete tone wizard. 
as far as production, I would want to pair with him and I want to pair with uh, Justin Vernon from Bon Iver. And then if I can like get a third one in there and just like produce a track, it'd be Kanye. Get like oh, Kanye, be... Justin, Afy. Oh my God, that would be incredible to see what Kanye would do. But I gotta say, Brittany Howard, oh my God, your vocals would go insane together. And Alabama Shakes too. Yeah, and that, like Alabama imagine Shakes. More, yeah, I'm just like imagine right now, you guys plus Alabama Shakes, great concert. And then I would steal Johnny and Tom York from Radiohead. That's oh, it. yeah, that. That's Those that's the dream. Are... That's the dream team, and then an entire, probably like an entire gospel choir, choir from like the deep south. Oh, the Sunday service choir. I actually heard that that Kanye used, and then not to mention, I was listening to yeah. Elton John and Stevie Wonder's collaboration. After all, they were featured in that beautiful song, by the way. And I think you guys would be perfect with that. Oh my God, the, I, I like. How do you get in to see the Sunday service? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But like I'm like I listen to them. So not I haven't seen them. Yeah. I'm like, I want to like scheme on how to like get a ticket to that somehow. That'd be a pretty crazy thing to witness. Absolutely, absolutely. So it Dan, so a lot of bands right now are starting to get ready to prepare for the road or also enter a nev or try to get back into the studio after being after COVID and everything. So do you have any advice? for the bands, for up and coming bands and also aspiring bands who are about ready to and return to the stage for the first time. Yeah, like just find the fire. Don't worry about what everyone else is doing right now around you. The world needs music right now. Just make music, make good things, like put it out. Find and and find your tribe. That's the that's a, that's that's a new one in my brain is like find the right tribe find the people who are going to like listen to your music and love it don't worry about the people who are going to hate it like it's not important just you need that fuel right now so it's a hard time I, I found during the pandemic like people had really hard time creating and i and I, I didn't know why it was a very strange feeling so it's like now that we're hopefully on the tail end of this thing like you know tap for the people who are just picking this up or like just gearing up to go on tour like us you know persist don't quit and like just keep breaking those doors down man just find find do what you got to do world needs us absolutely guys do so one final question i have are you ready for it all right bring it on wait i already know i think you already told me i have told you but however this is the first time for my audience so <laughs> Where can my audience find the Honey Runners music and where can they connect with you on social media? Okay. Number one, Spotify. Follow us, listen to the music, add us to your playlist. That's the most helpful. Uh, you can also find us on Tidal, Amazon Music, Apple. Um, you know, you can stream it, you can buy it. We're going to put up a pre order for vinyl if you like vinyl or you want CDs. You want to get merch just go to honeyrunners.com we're gonna have a um, like an order a merch order thing up in about two weeks and then uh to, if you want to interact with us hit us up on facebook go to facebook.com slash honeyrunners our twitter handle is just at honeyrunners all one word and same with instagram just at honeyrunners come find us come say hi all righty guys if you missed an episode of the jake's take with jacob i share podcast Visit our channels on Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Spreaker, and just added Podcast Addict. All right, that is Jake's Take with Jacob L.A. Share, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Are you on social media? Because I'm on social media too. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, Jacob L.A. Share, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Once again, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. And Dan, I am so happy to share this that jakes-shake.com is celebrating its 10th anniversary Ooh. this year. 10 years, man. Yeah, 10 years. It's been a long ride. So if you guys want to hear, hear read my take on mixtape head, and all see all these interviews and all these concert reviews, head to jakes-shake.com. 
And one final thing, if you're financially able to, please consider heading to PayPal to help keep jakestake.com and my platform up and running. I, if you can, I totally understand it. But however, if you can, thank you so much in advance. But if you're thinking of an alternative, a great way for, for, for you to help me out is to follow me and subscribe to everything that I do. So thank you so much, guys, in advance. Dan, I am so proud of the Honey Runners. I am so grateful to have sits down with you. I think this you guys are on fire, and I cannot wait to see what you guys do next. Thank you so much. That's really nice of you to say. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much for watching. Until next time, have a great one, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in.